Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan, and it's not spawn year. It is already, somehow, day 40 of my comic review video day calendar. And for today's issue, I asked Patreon to select the artist, and the artist they picked was Alex Ross. So I chose Justice number 1, which is partly written and drawn by Alex Ross. Uh, he did do uh, some writing on the books that he drew. Uh, there are a couple of additional credits here as well. We've got Jim Kruger uh, with with a story credit and Doug Braithwaite with additional art. And I'm not sure where uh, either of these guys begins and Alex Ross ends. Uh, so I don't know if any of the dialogue is Alex Ross's or not. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to tell with that. The artwork is all of his hallmarks. Uh, so... It looks like just straight up Alex Ross art. Uh, it's fully painted. It's breathtaking. It's just what you would expect looking at things like Marvels. And I see Justice as the opposite of Vengeance. No, I see Justice as the kind of counterpart to Marvels, uh, written by Kurt Busiek, which is uh, from 1996, one of my absolute favorite Marvel books of all time. And Justice is wonderful too, but it's been a long time since I've read it, and I think I've read all 12 issues. This was a 12-issue maxi-series, uh, but it's been a long time, so... I mean, it's possible I only read part of this. I can't remember now. At some point, I'd like to go ahead and read this whole thing down and review it, of course, but I'll just give you the bare bones of the setup here. Uh, if it looks interesting to you, you should check it out. So uh, this comes out in 2005, and I didn't immediately uh, know the date, and I was thumbing through it trying to figure that out, and I thought I was going to have to look it up, and then I noticed that on the back cover, uh, you've got an ad for Batman Begins, and it comes out June 15th, it says, so uh, we, we can be sure that we are smack dab in the middle of 2005. Uh, like I said, Justice is kind of a counterpart to Marvel's, and it's about some similar things, but its philosophy and attitude is uh, much more on the DC side of things. So Marvel's is all about looking at uh, flawed three-dimensional human beings who from the outside in or from street level look like larger-than-life godlike characters and were kind of just ants under their boot. And But, but it turns out that they are just you know, regular real people like the rest of us. And with Justice, it is uh, similar to that, but the perspective is not from a regular uh, living and working person, still from a human being, but from the villain's perspective, uh, from one of the big enemies. And we, we have narration throughout the story, uh, and one of my only complaints about this is that it's a little bit redundant, may, maybe a, a little bit overwritten, but it's all about... Uh, and, and I'll tell you here in a second who the, the speaker is because we don't know until the very end of the issue. And uh, the further you get in, the more you might be able to call it. I think uh, the story does a good job of uh, keeping it kind of under wraps, and it's kind of a fun reveal at the end, even if it is a little bit typical uh, that you have this kind of formula where you're uh, hearing a speaker the whole time, you're wondering who it is, and then the person steps out of the shadows when you get the end of it and reveals who that is but th thematically this is all about how from at least uh, this guy's perspective how I uh, the su superheroes have taken I uh, humanity's power away from them or rather we've kind of given it up willingly maybe without even fully realizing it where we think we need someone to save us and because of that we've become lazy we've become kind of flaccid uh we haven't grown and evolved uh, the way we should to be able to protect ourselves because human nature the way we uh, better ourselves is through adversity and we need to go through all these growing pains so that we can survive and if we just give 
our own responsibilities to somebody else. He talks about the superheroes, uh, the, the Justice League, almost like they're another race. Uh, they're spoken of a lot more like a pantheon than even in Marvels because of, uh, again, the classic attitude of uh, Marvel, or of DC, pardon me, with the superheroes as more of mythological characters, uh, more larger-than-life icons to be, um, to be revered and almost worshipped. And so we'll find out that, and this, this is perfect with the, the attitude and perspective of this character, we'll find out at the end of the story that the person that has been uh, spouting all of these complaints is in fact Lex Luthor, and that it, it turns out there's this uh, huge catastrophe that's about to happen, and perhaps only the villains can save us this time. And so it's uh, kind of a neat setup because uh, at first you think it's an end of the world scenario from the get go. Uh, we're seeing all of uh, the Justice League trying to prevent a catastrophe that is already getting started and completely failing royally. So from Lex Lex's perspective, the idea is uh, we gave the superheroes uh, all of our responsibility and they failed. They squandered it. Uh, and because we just sat back and... Uh, let them do everything for us, this kind of culture of dependency, uh, there's nothing that we can do to, uh, to, to save the world ourselves now. And so now it's going to, uh, instead of deferring to the superheroes, we're going to have to defer to the villains. And this is the whole reason that classically Lex Luthor hates Superman. This idea that we need an alien who seems perfect, can do no wrong, who Lex doesn't understand how he could not be corrupted by the level of power he has, because, of course, Lex himself has this ends justifies the means sort of philosophy, either uh, is kind of corrupted by his power or sees uh, doing the wrong thing sometimes for the right reasons as a necessary evil, you be the judge uh, on you know where, where you fall on whatever version of Lex it is we're talking about. But it seems really fitting that that is the speaker in this scenario. Uh, just look at this this artwork again. It's absolutely breathtaking. Uh, I've always been really impressed with the, uh, the the kind of lighting effects that Alex Ross comes up with with uh, his artwork. Everything looks like it belongs uh, on your wall uh, as a pinup. Even the smaller panels, uh, you, you just want to pull those up and blow them up and put them somewhere. Um, it's it's absolutely flawless. And uh, Ross's, and I mean, I know not everybody is uh, the biggest fan of Ross for uh, interiors over covers necessarily, uh, but for this kind of thing, when when we're talking about the mythic nature of these characters especially, and with the grand scale of this, uh, I really appreciate getting to see it rendered like this, uh, where it just looks like an event, it looks like a real big deal, and all of these faces are so photorealistic, you have to you know, simultaneously really stylized, and you have to remind yourself that you're not looking at photos, that you're not looking at, like, like actors playing the parts. Uh, and I love how Alex Ross's stuff is so, uh, like, classic and time, timeless, simultaneously feels uh, very modern and of this time, you know, all at once. Uh, he really likes, he does this with Kingdom Come, too, despite that it's an older Superman with the graying hair. His Superman looks like George Reeves to me and looks like kind of a golden age super, Superman. And he does the same thing with some of his other characters here, particularly the men, where I I, I see a lot of the facial structures, the, these these kind of uh, like uh, I don't know, chiseled jaws as we like 40s and 50s uh, kind of uh, are kind of stereotypes. And anyway, what we're seeing at the beginning here is this worldwide uh, cataclysm. And you think 
that you're seeing the world end. And you are, but it hasn't happened yet. So we're going to have uh, kind of that conceit, which I'm a little tired of, uh, but... You know, I'm giving it a pass here because it's it's an exciting setup, and uh, I saw it a lot more after this, certainly. But the idea is, for whatever reason, a lot of the big supervillains and uh, like Legion of Doom level villains are all having a shared nightmare of the end of the world, where the Justice League loses, and. They uh, don't know what to make of it, but uh, Lex sees this as a sign that they need to incapacitate the superheroes and take matters into their own hands. And so that's the plan that he starts to set in motion. And so we get this nice tender scene here with Aquaman and Mira where, uh, like, the first superhero that we go to, we're immediately uh, exploring these characters as real people who are human beings, uh, whether they are literally human or not, or, or fully human, who want the same things that uh, regular people want, and uh, who have this enormous pressure where the weight of the world is on their shoulders as superheroes because, again, humanity has handed them that responsibility and uh, they've accepted it. In Aquaman's uh, the case, somewhat begrudgingly, he talks here about how he wishes he could just be a husband and a father and didn't have uh, the, the regal responsibilities and the superhero responsibilities, but uh, he does those things nevertheless because what kind of a man would he be if he shirked those responsibilities? Oh, look at this seahorse. That's, that's a, out, outstanding. And so I uh, that's set up so that we'll uh, kind of see Aquaman as a, a uh, real person juxtaposed with the way Lex has been couching all of this, uh, where the the, uh, the heroes are almost a, a different species than human. Uh, and the way that's talked about is, uh, I'll mention this real quick, is a little bit weird because I... Uh, and I get that, that that this is all from Lex Luthor's perspective, but um, you you kind of get the sense that Alex Ross is having to uh, kind of get around the fact that more of the Justice League are regular people, or at least were born human beings, uh, than he wants to give it credit for because of that kind of big distinction we're making between Marvel heroes and DC heroes. And so, like, it kind of works because it's from Lex's perspective, but even Lex, I feel like, wouldn't make the kind of mistake that he makes when he says, uh, like, like, of course, um, the only character in this dream that is, and, and this is a... Uh, premonition of the future that will actually happen. Kind of like uh, uh, Isaac Mendez, I think is his name, from, from the first season of Heroes, that uh, Green Lantern is the only one of them who is able to come up with any kind of a solution to save people. Everybody else completely fails. And uh, Lex says, well, of course he does that, because he's human. But then a scene ago we see the Flash just have a nervous breakdown because he's not able to rescue anyone in his city. And he's also human? So I don't really understand that. Unless the idea is that we're seeing Flash here. I don't mean to overthink this. Unless the idea is we're seeing Flash here, but there's not any narration boxes here, so maybe that's not part of the dream that Lex is seeing, but... I don't know why we're seeing it if it's not part of that collective dream. And the, the the sense you get is that all the villains that dreamed this all saw the same things. Uh, you got this real kind of uh, disturbing, horrendous shot of Martian Manhunter dying here uh, in, in this as this amorphous, monstrous blob when he's trying to shapeshift. And he, uh, you know, horribly dies in fire, which is the worst possible way for Martian Manhunter to die, of course. And anyway, uh, we meet Captain Cold, and then we 
So he's involved in all of this. He's going to meet Lex, and then I uh, we find that Black Manta has been given a mission to go kidnap Aquaman. So this is the beginning of uh, grabbing all of the Justice League up so that they're incapacitated and the villains can save the world. And we don't really know what's going on yet, but that's going to be explained right at the end here. So you've got the man in the trench coat and hat who will turn out to be Lex Luthor. He takes his hat off and uh, says, Martian Manhunter, you are the Martian Manhunter. Pardon me. Um, uh, Black Manta. Did I say Martian Manhunter earlier? Black Manta. Uh, you're the first to arrive, sit anywhere, we're going to have this meeting uh, of the minds with all of these villains. And uh, it's a real intriguing and enticing setup, I think, and it certainly makes me want to continue reading and uh, go go through the series again and see if I remember anything about uh, the second half of this, because I cannot remember if I've read this whole thing. Um... But I, uh, and, and I don't think my wife ever did either, uh, who insisted that we get this because I, uh, she loved the artwork so much. I mean, like, and, and who, who can blame her? I, uh, like, she rarely ever did that, but, uh, and she loves Marvels too for the same reason, but I mean, just look at it. It's, it's, it's gorgeous. It's stunning. Uh, so at some point, I will review the rest of this, of course, but uh, this one is a little shorter than these usually have been, uh, but I just wanted to show you the artwork, give you the basic setup of this. Uh, it's just the uh, the first chapter, so not a lot else for us to sink our teeth into today, but thanks a lot for watching, and I'll be back with you again tomorrow for another one. Don't know what I'm doing yet, but I uh, consider subscribing to Patreon if you would like to uh, help out occasionally in choosing stuff or uh, aspects of books for me to review on the show. Uh, I've already had Patreon pick three or four things uh, 40 days in, so um, just uh, two, the $2 tier uh, gets you access to polls and things like that. I uh, for things for uh, shows like this, patreon.com/slash And thanks so very much for watching. Once again, I'm Captain Logan, and happy reading.